Hi, would you like to join me for some lunch? Okay, not really. So you're wondering, what's this bowl here? We've got some peppers and wow, look at this potato, corn, and oh, one of my favorites, broccoli. Well, did you know that many of the vegetables that we eat are actually developed through a process of artificial selection? The ancient ancestor of the broccoli is actually a mustard plant. So thank you for joining me again. This is Margaret Evans here back with AP Bio Live. And I'm going to take you on a journey today through Unit 7, which is natural selection. So are we ready? Let's go ahead and get started. So what will we learn today in Unit 7? Well, Unit 7 is a pretty big unit, so we're going to break this down into parts. Remember that this is just an overview, and so we're taking some of the most important nuggets of information to give to you guys so that we can get you all shored up and ready to go. So Topic 7.2 is going to be on natural selection, 7.3, artificial selection, population genetics, and the good old Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Don't forget to access that tiny URL down there, down below. Give me a shout out and some feedback to let me know how I'm doing and how we're doing as an AP Live team. Hey there, Mr. Monsoor, as he'll be back for you tomorrow to take you on the other half of this Unit 7. Also, you got your cell phone? Go ahead and scan that QR code and we're going to go ahead and get started. So before we go ahead and dive into natural selection today, uh, you guys are providing some great questions in the feedback. I wish we had time to get through all of them, but once again, we'll pick and choose those that kind of come up often and will help with providing some additional clarification. So a couple of sessions ago when I did my last session um, on meiosis, there was a question that came up a couple of times about is crossing over the same as the law of independent assortment? So glad you asked. Well, when it comes to the law of segregation, there's actually two aspects of that law. Oftentimes in class, um, you'll hear your teachers talk about the law of segregation um, and independent assortment as it relates to uh, how things are separated into uh, different uh, gametes. And so as it relates to the independent assortment, oh, and it looks like here, uh, sorry, one slight mistake there. That's supposed to be two aspects of the law of independent assortment. Sorry about that. See, even teachers can get that confused. So we'll just say two aspects of the law of independent assortment is what we're talking about. And there's two aspects of that. And that is that all the maternal slash paternal chromosomes will not be placed in the same gamete. So that means the information that you inherit from mom or the information you inherit from dad, uh, when your cells go through meiosis, that information will be put into different cells. So not all of mom's information will end up in the same gamete and not all of dad's information will end up in the same gamete. So that's the first aspect of the law of independent assortment, law of independent assortment instead. The second aspect of that is the recombination of genes occurs during crossing over. So we get all this awesome genetic diversity when those genes independently assort. So when those chromosomes cross over and you get all this swapping of genetic information, that is another part of the law of independent assortment, which says that those genes can independently swap between the homologs. And so when we were talking about this back in meiosis, we were saying that we discovered that genes could actually be linked on the same chromosome so that when one gene swaps, it's carrying another gene with it or another gene is always going with it. And that's a violation of the second component of the law of independent assortment. So once again, law of independent assortment actually has two components. Yes, not all of the maternal and paternal chromosomes will end up in the same gamete, but the second part of that is that that genetic information should be able to independently swap with between the homologs during crossing over. So glad you guys asked that question and hopefully that provided some further clarification. Next question is, is tr in translation during the process of elongation, 
Is it the tRNA that moves the amino acids to the growing chain or is it the rRNA? Well, it's actually a tRNA. The tRNA has these little amino acids attached to them and they will come to the location of the ribosome. They will come and drop off their amino acids. And then the rRNA, uh, there's molecules, there's enzymes inside of the ribosomal subunits, specialized rRNA molecules that actually act like enzymes. And I know that you guys have learned that enzymes are typically proteins, but in this case, these ribosomal RNA molecules, which are actually nucleic acids, they can actually act as enzymes and help to catalyze the linking of the amino acids together. So once again, tRNA comes, drops off its amino acids, and these special rRNA molecules within the ribosome act as enzymes, catalyze the reaction that links those amino acids together. Third question, could you please go over which strand of DNA RNA is coded on and the directionality of RNA? Well, the messenger RNA is actually synthesized in a five to three prime direction, which means that the first nucleotide that's laid down for the messenger strand should have a terminal phosphate because that terminal phosphate is indicative of the five prime end. So when that first nucleotide in the messenger RNA strand is laid down, then you should have that terminal phosphate and then the other nucleotides are connected to it in a five prime to three prime direction, similar to how DNA replication occurs when new strands are created. And the strand that's serving as the template for the messenger RNA synthesis is actually called the non-coding strand. And it's the non-coding strand because the actual gene of interest is located on the other DNA strand. And because of the weird uh, base pairing rules, in order to copy, quote unquote, in order to copy information from a strand, you actually don't use that strand. You use its complement. So the template strand of DNA serves as the strand to which the messenger RNA will be synthesized so that the information on the other strand on the coding strand is actually copied into the messenger because of that base pairing rule thing. And then lastly, how are introns removed from uh, removed during RNA processing. Well, there are these small nuclear ribo, nu nu I'm sorry, small, small nuclear ribonucleoprotein complexes that remove the introns from the premature messenger RNA strand. So what is a ribonucleoprotein complex? Well, basically it's a, it's a combination of a nucleic acid, in this case, some RNA and some proteins, and they work together in order to remove these introns off of the premature um, RNA strand. So hopefully the answer to those questions were helpful. Now it's time for us to get into some natural selection and unit seven. So let's go ahead and review. So a couple of highlights from 7.2 is that A, natural selection is a random process. I know, I know, the word kind of implies selection, like the environment is saying, I pick you and I choose you and I choose you. But that is a random process that is determined by the uh, what organisms uh, are best suited for the environment based on the traits that they just happen to have and the environmental conditions and do we get a great match for survival and reproduction. So that is definitely a random process and it acts on the phenotypic variations. Remember, phenotype is your expressed genetic information. And expressed doesn't mean that I should be able to see it all the time. Expressed just means that it's a part of the uh, physical nature of that organism, like blood type. I can't look at you and tell that you have blood type O, but the fact that you have that blood type is an expression of your genetic information for, um, uh, for blood type. So when we say phenotypic variations, expressed genetic information, natural selection acts on that. Environments change, okay? The, 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 the environment is not in stasis, it changes all the time. And these different changes that occur actually apply pressures on the population. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And it's important to understand that some variations, some phenotypic variations can actually improve an organism's chance to survive and reproduce in that environment. 
if the organism happens to have it, that particular variation, or sometimes it can be a detriment depending upon the situational aspects of that environment. And once again, those AP Daily videos are there for additional support. Let's take a look at some of the examples. So here we have an example of genetic variation. So here's my little friendly, my little friendly animals here. And we see all these different uh, variations in the population, in the fur color. And these are natural genetic variations within this population. And so depending upon the environment, Maybe the brown fur might be more advantageous in one environment, but if we take the same population and put them in a completely different environment, maybe the white fur will be more advantageous, clearly if it's a snowy environment, et cetera. So these natural variations that occur in the population are actually what natural selection acts upon. And I did try to recruit my little furry friends here, my cats to be a part of this video here and show me a cameo, but they denied me. So feline rejection is the worst. So we have our little furry friends here instead that are showing us that we can have variation within our population and that natural selection acts upon that variation. Let's take a look at another example here. Well, I'm sure many teachers often use the peppered moth example of an industrial revolution. And, and at this time, there was all this fog and smog and stuff that was placed into the environment. And it discolored the barks of the trees. And because of that, it shifted which variation in this uh, moth population was being selected for. So where when the, the bark on the trees was a lighter color, then the lighter colored moths had more of an advantage because they had camouflage when they landed on the bark and it was harder for the predators to see them. But then after all of this pollution was put into the air over many, many years and it began to discolor and darken the bark of the tree, then the moths that happened to have the black coloration, they winded up benefiting from an advantage of camouflage and being selected. So over time, we saw this shift in the frequency of black moths and the frequency of white moths, meaning before the pollution episode, the white moths were more frequent in the population. After the pollution episode, we saw that it was shifting towards the black mobs being more pop, uh, more um, frequent in the population. And it's not like the mobs had a choice and they were like, oh, because the trees are darker, let me just turn myself to be darker. Uh, we'd have to understand that these variations have to already exist in the population and that the environmental conditions will sort of select which of those variations is more uh, advantageous and gives, and it gives those organisms a better chance of survival and reproduction. Doesn't mean that the the variation that's not as favored will always die out and we'll never see that other variation again. Because remember, those variations can be preserved in the heterozygous individual. So when we're talking about those Punnett squares, how can a new variation or seemingly, seemingly new variation appear again? Because the heterozygous individual might be still carrying a recessive gene um, that you know, under certain circumstances, when the recessive phenotype is present, then hey, maybe the environment will favor the recessive phenotype and you'll see more frequent reproduction and survival of those organisms. And over time, the recessive phenotype will become more frequent. So that's just to give you an idea of how shifts in variations and frequencies of, of variations can occur. So some variations can increase fitness, give you a better chance of survival and reproduction. That's a part of fitness. You got to be able to survive, but you got to live long enough to reproduce and pass those advantages on to the next offspring. So let's go ahead and jump to the next example uh, here or our misconceptions. So a couple of misconceptions we want to uh, erase and get out of our brains. Go away, misconceptions. Natural selection is a non-random process. That is a misconception. It is absolutely random. There's another misconception that every phenotype is either an advantage or a disadvantage. Dif disadvantage. Sometimes some phenotypes are just neutral, meaning that doesn't provide you an advantage or a disadvantage, which means natural selection really won't act on those um, neutral uh, phenotypes. 
Natural selection can act on genetic information that's not expressed. Wrong, 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 wrong. Phenotype means it has to be expressed in order for natural selection to act upon it. So the genetic information has got to be expressed for natural selection to be able to act upon it. Organisms can change though their adaptations. Hmm, that's very Lamarckian, Lamarckian of you, and that is absolutely not possible. So if for some reason I go and I get, uh, you know, um, some new sort of scar on my arm because I, you know, got into uh, a little bit of a tiff or an accident and I had this scar on my arm, that's an acquired trait. I now have a scar. But that doesn't mean my children are going to inherit the scar. That information has got to be a part of my genetic information in order for it to be passed on, expressed potentially, and natural selection to act upon it. Also, I know that everybody likes to go to this whole survival of the fittest, and they think about the strongest, the strongest will survive. Well, sometimes it's not about the strongest. Sometimes it's about the most quiet. Sometimes it's about the smallest. The point here is if the phenotypic variation provides an advantage, no matter what it is, think about a sloth. You might think, how has this organism lasted so long? It barely moves. Well, that must be an advantage in the environment. And that's the reason why that characteristic of sloths still persists in their species and in their population. So fitness has nothing to do necessarily with strength. It has to do with, do you have an advantage of reproduction and uh, passing on those traits to the next offspring. And once again, acquired traits like a scar cannot be inherited. All righty, let's go ahead and jump on and move on to the next. 7.3, artificial selection. Bringing back my broccoli. Broccoli, anyone? Well, remember that not only do you have these natural forces that are working in the environment, but humans, have actually um, been able to affect variation in many, many species. And so humans have been able to selectively breed organisms uh, through agricultural means, um, you know, sports means as it relates to breeding horses and dogs and cats and those sorts of things. So there is an element of this selection that is being implemented by human activities. And we'll take a look at an example of that. In addition to that, there is a phenomenon known as convergent evolution in which you can have very distantly related organisms that can end up having similar phenotypic variations being selected for because they live in similar environments with the same selective pressures. So like your flying squirrels and your sugar gliders both have those like patty uh, flaps that allow them to fly from tree to tree. Well, they are really not related to each other. They're really cute, but really not related to each other. But why is it that they both have those adaptations? That's because similar selective pressures in their environment have selected over the evolutionary process for that particular trait to be selected for as an advantage. So let's take a look at first at artificial selection. So here's, oh, aren't they so cute? Um, here's our dogs here. And a lot of the breeding that we do is by way of natural selection. I'm sorry, artificial selection. There we go. And so all of these dogs, they're not different species. People think that their breeds means different species. So all of these dogs are the same species. But why do they vary so much? Why do they look so different from one another? Because of artificial selection. Somebody thought that spots were really cool. So if you had this mutation where these spots popped up in a dog and you wanna keep preserving the spots, then you can artificially breed the only the dogs with spots. And over a period of time, then we get this breed called Dalmatians. And oh, look at the pug, that little smushed face, so cute. Somebody must've thought that that'd be cool to kind of breed that variation so it's more prevalent in the population. And that's how we get these, um, what we call breeds. And in the case of agriculture, different strains or different um, types of vegetables over or fruits and vegetables over time. Okay, so this idea of selective breeding is an example of artificial selection, meaning humans. Humans are driving the selection process opposed to just the natural occurrences in the environment. 
Moving on, taking a look at convergent evolution. So convergent evolution is not artificial selection, but it just falls underneath this topic in the course, uh, uh, the course description. So I don't want you all to think that artificial selection and convergent evolution are the same thing. It just falls underneath that topic as it relates to making sure that students understand that similar selective pressures can ultimately increase the frequency of similar phenotypic variations. And so the shark here and the um, porpoise or the dolphin here, they're really not related to each other because a dolphin is a mammal and a shark is a fish. However, that streamlined body, those dorsal fins, some of those major key phenotypic adaptations of these two animals um, have been selected for in their separate lineages. Why? because their environmental conditions are very similar. And over time, those traits have been selected for and they uh, continue in their lineages. Um, and these are called analogous structures um, that we see here that are evident of convergent evolution. So when you're looking at organisms that are similar, not really related to one another, why do they have traits that look alike? It's not magic, it's not evolution magic, it's similar selective pressures are favoring the same phenotypic variations over time. All right, some misconceptions. Artificial selection causes mutations. So a lot of students think that because humans are going in there and we're selectively breeding, who's gonna breed with who, that that process causes mutations to occur. Not so, mutations are completely random, completely unpredictable. And so natural selection, uh, artificial selection, neither one of them causes mutations, but if a mutation occurs and provides the organism with an advantage, then natural selection can favor that new mutation, or if the mutation causes a disadvantage, then potentially the, you won't see the uh, frequency of that mutation increase in the population. Artificial selection does not occur in nature, hence the word artificial. Okay, it is driven by human activity. Um, organisms do not evolve to be similar. So the dolphin was not talking to the shark saying, you know, it would be nice if we both had the same body types. This is due to similar selective pressures over time favoring the same the same traits, okay? So that's important for us to remember. All righty, so let's take do some practice here. So for 7.3, our skill is simply describing data. And so I know there have been several students that have been asking, well, what's the difference between a describe and an explain and identify those task verbs get me confused? Well, usually with an identify, it just means to name it, to point it out, to call it by its name, uh, that will be identify. If it's a, it's a data point on a graph, it might say identify uh, the time in the graph in which X, Y, and Z happens. So you're just identifying that time. You're just naming that time. Identify how model A is different from model B. You're just giving a characteristic that makes them different. Describe means to give a little bit more relevant facts. OK, um, relevant characteristics that links connections or links information together. And so here we have a describe. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But just before just so I, before I go into this, I know people ask about an explain and explain is going further than a describe because a describe is just providing relevant characteristics of a situation, a scenario, a model. But an explain is how how is this happening? Why is this happening? That's an explain. We're now going into a deeper understanding and providing um, connections there. So here we have a comparison of geographic locations, adaptations, and evolutionary origins of two different species, the wombat and the woodchuck. Anytime you're given a data table, take a look to see what's in there and analyze it. And one of the things we should have noticed here is that the adaptations are the same. They both have rodent-like teeth, they eat roots and et cetera, 
but they came from completely different locations. The wombat lives in Australia, woodchuck lives in North America, and their evolutionary origins are different. So this is that gives you an idea that they don't, they're not closely related organisms and they li live in two completely different continents. I mean, they couldn't be any further apart almost. So we're looking at then how is it that they have phenotypic variations that are similar to one another. And so let's take a look here. Well, the first one, it says separate populations of the same species experience different environmental conditions. Well, that's wrong because remember, in order to get similar phenotypic variations in two distantly related organisms, they had to be experiencing similar environmental conditions. And this one is saying different environmental conditions. It says humans in Australia bred wombats with similar traits as woodchucks found in North America. Well, there's nothing in here that's suggesting artificial selection. There's nothing suggesting that humans had a hand in any of this. So this is definitely um, not an artificial selection. So letter D should be the right answer. Similar selective pressures in Australia and North America led to the wombat and woodchucks having similar adaptations over time. Wombats and woodchucks do not come from common ancestors. Remember the evolutionary origin says they're placental and marsupial, not the same not common ancestry. So letter C should not be the correct choice. It is in fact, letter D. Whew, that seems like I evaded a, uh, a tragedy there. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and move forward. So we're moving on to population genetics uh, and a couple of things that we need to know about population genetics here. Evolution is driven by random occurrences. We've said that mutations are random. Uh, activities like migration and gene flow and genetic drift can actually come in and affect the frequency of particular genes over time. Uh, and so that's important to know that there can be some uh, movement of individuals into and out of populations that can change frequencies of alleles within that population over time, and that there are environmental events that can either decrease populations dramatically and shift frequencies, uh, and we'll talk about those as well. So let's look at a couple of examples. Well, here is something called the bottleneck effect. And the bottleneck effect is referring to a, an, an ecological event that drastically reduces the size of the population. So maybe we have this population of beetles living in the environment. There's the cute little ladybugs there. And maybe somebody comes through and sprays some pesticide and it kills off a large percent of the beetles. And then all of a sudden we have this small population that's left behind. Well, whoever is left behind is who's available to reproduce and pass on their genes. And so through the devastation of that population, through the killing off of a large number of the individuals in that population, we actually could have decreased the phenotypic variation in the population. So you see how we had some individuals here with some red, some red coloration. Well, if all of those individuals who had the red coloration got killed off or the ones who were carrying that information got killed off, then that particular variation may not be evident in the population any longer. Um, and so those who survive are the ones who are able to reproduce and pass on their genetic information. So severe ecological events that can devastate populations can also greatly change the variation in that population. Let's look at another example here. Here we have what's called a founder population. And so if we have a situation where we have a group of individuals, and so let's think about the last slide there where the ecological event happened. Oh no, oh no, lots of beetles died. And then we have this one population that's left behind. That population begins to grow over time, produce more offspring, and they begin to reestablish the population again. And that's the idea of the founder effect. Maybe that population of beetles that was left behind, maybe they moved to another lo location that was more suitable for survival, and they begin to have offspring. And over time, generations, we have more and more. And if you notice, look, we have some red, red beetles again. How could that have happened? Well, if some of those black or white beetles was carrying the red uh, information, 
Remember, you only see what is expressed. And so they could have been carrying that red information and through their, their reproduction within that population, we get that variation showing up again uh, in a couple of generations. All righty, here is another way that population frequencies can change. Um, we have what's called migration, and a migration can include going into an environment or coming out of an, an environment. That's the difference between immigration with an I and immigration with an E. Immigration with an I meaning new individuals are coming in. Immigration with an E means individuals are leaving out. And so when new or individuals enter into a population, they bring with them their genes and they are bringing possibly new genetic information into that population. And if they get a chance to reproduce with other individuals in that population, that then their genetic information becomes a part of the gene pool. And potentially their genetic information can increase in frequency as more breeding and more breeding and more breeding occurs. So individuals moving in and out of populations can actually influence the frequencies of genetic information within those populations. Misconceptions. Migration only involves entrance into a population. Remember, there's immigration with an E, exit out. Immigration with an I, hello, come on in. So migration refers to both leaving out and coming in. And both of those individuals leaving out of a population, individuals coming into a population, both of those situations can potentially affect the frequency of genes in the population as new genes are brought in or genes are taken with you when you leave out. Uh, some students believe that the bottleneck events decrease population size, but not diversity. Well, bo bottleneck effects uh, events will typically also uh, decrease diversity because if you are severely, drastically reducing the size of the population, then there is a great chance that some of that good, rich biodiversity or that diversity within the population will also dramatically decrease. And genetic drift can be seen in large populations. Genetic drift is referring to these small shifts in frequency within a population. Well, if it's a really, really big population, then having one or two people or individuals come into the population and bringing their genes with them more than likely will not greatly affect the frequency of genetic information in an extremely large population. So things like migration, you really can't see the effects of migration on very, very large populations the way that you can see them, um, to see that effect on very small populations. All righty, so moving on to some practice here, we have stating a hypothesis, and I know people have questions about what a null hypothesis is. Well, a null hypothesis is saying is a pretty much a hypothesis that states that whatever change is happening in the environment, there's really no relationship between the two variables that you're observing. So in this particular example here, we have some spotted owls living in the Cascade Mountains, and we've noticed that there's some other owls, the barred owls, who are living in the same population. And we think that there's going to be some competition between the nesting habitats. Well, the null hypothesis would say it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter who's coming into the population. The fact that these new owls are present in the population shouldn't have any effect on the old owls that are in the population. So there is a suspicion that that may not be the case, that there could be an effect. So we're looking at studying the effect of barred owl populations on nesting choices of the spotted owls. So the researchers record songs from these other owls and they play them in this environment to see if the spotted owls will actually change their nesting behaviors because they think that another owl is in the environment. Who, who? Who's in the environment? Oh, another owl is in the environment. So which of the following is a valid null hypothesis for this investigation? Well, spotted owls will hear the barred owl songs and look for nests to destroy. Well, that's not a null hypothesis because the null hypothesis was, would say that the other owls are not affecting the spotted owl population. There's no correlation, no relationship. The spotted owls will not nest in the area where bar, uh, barred owl so, uh, songs are played. Um, well, once again, if they're choosing to not nest because there's another owl in the environment, then that means that there is a correlation and the null hypothesis is stating that there is no correlation between those two things. 
The spotted owl chicks will starve because their parents are scared of the barred owls. Once again, that's saying that there is an effect, there is an impact of the barred owls on the spotted owls and the null hypothesis would state that there isn't. So therefore, spotted owls will continue to nest in the same areas, regardless of whether the spot barred owls are present or not. That would be an appropriate null hypothesis for this situation. Okay, moving on lastly to our Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And so uh, taking a look at Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium formulas is just giving us a mathematical tool to determine whether or not a population is evolving. So in biology, we can use mathematical tools to assist us uh, when it's impossible for us to observe the entire population. Clearly, you know, we can't observe the entire population. So oftentimes we take what's called sample data and we use that sample data, plug it into some fancy data fancy mathematical equations, and that can help give us some indication as to whether or not evolution is occurring or natural selection is occurring in these naturally um, occurring environments. So let's take a look at an example. So when it comes to your formula sheet, there are two main formulas that you need to be familiar with with the Hardy-Weinberg equations, p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1 and p plus q equals 1. And what we're saying here with these formulas is that if you're thinking of the totality of the environment, there are only three possible genotypes that can exist in an environment. That would be your heterozygous, your homozygous dominant, and your homo and homozygous recessive. And if you look at a single gene trait and, and you look at all the possible genotypes for that trait, those are the three populations, uh, those are the three possibilities that could occur in the population. And that is sort of in reinforced by this concept of a Punnett square. So if we look at this Punnett square here, we see that if we cross two heterozygotes, then we are able to get all three possible outcomes in our uh, in our uh, Punnett square. And if we take that idea and apply it to the Hardy-Weinberg equation, we're pretty, pretty much saying that the one occurrence of the big A, big A in the Punnett square is our P squared. Think about math. If you multiply a big A by a big A, that's the same as A squared. So that's where the P squared is. That's the homozygous dominant. Then if we take a look at the A, the big A and little a, that's the heterozygous individual. And how many are in the Punnett square? There's two of them. That's the 2PQ, PQ being the heterozygous. There's two of them, possible outcomes in this Punnett square. And then we have the little a, little a, which is our Q squared. And that is our homozygous recessive genotype. And that is a little a times little a, which is a squared. So if you think about it from that perspective, that's how this formula was kind of generated to say, what are the total possible outcomes for genotype combinations and using the heterozygote uh, cross with another heterozygote and applying that mathematically. That's how we get that Hardy -Wein, first Hardy-Weinberg equation. And then the second one just deals with the fact it goes back to good old Mendelian inheritance that says there are two genes that exist, that exist for a single uh, trait. You have a dominant and a recessive. And if you total up all of those genes, they will represent 100% of the gene pool. So if we total up all the P's, all the dominants that exist in the gene pool, and we total up all of the recessives that exist in the gene pool, then that represents 100% of our gene pool. And that first equation says that each individual has two two alleles for those particular traits. Okay, so that's hopefully that'll give you some better understanding of where, how those formulas were generated. And now we're gonna take a look at how do we use them. So here, before we get into the usage of the equations, um, Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium says that in order to have a population that's not evolving, in order to have no evolution, these five things must hold true all five of them must hold true. You have to have a large population, no mutation, no migration in or out. You can't have any types of sexual selection because when you do sexual selection, it's like, hmm, I'm going to pick you because you're a lion with a big, beautiful mane or you're a peacock with these big, beautiful feathers. So I'm going to have uh, mating choices for you versus some, some other organism. You can't have any sexual selection uh, and you can't have any natural selection. So the question is, will that ever happen? Will there ever be a natural environment in which all five of these things 
are not in existence? And the answer to that is no, that's why it's a hypothetical. But in order to look at a population over time and to see that the frequencies are never changing, they are static, that means all five of these things must be in play. And so we know that in a real population, that's not gonna be the case. So we have to do some detective work and figure out what's actually happening that's keeping the frequencies from not being in equilibrium. Do we have natural selection happening? Do we have some kind of migration from one population to the next? Are there some new mutations popping up? And so when we see those changes, it's an indication that one of these conditions of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is not being met. And that's why we see that the frequencies are changing. All right, so let's take a look at an example here um, of how do we apply the Hardy-Weinberg formula. So it says that evolution is uh, changing frequencies over time, and we have a particular gene um, locus in a population where they're telling you that the frequency of the recessive allele is 0 0.4, and the frequency of the dominant is um, 0 0.6. And so here is just how, if you're given mathematical values, how do we use our Hardy-Weinberg formula to actually come up with the genotype. And remember, genotype would be this first equation here. Who is homozygous dominant, heterozygous, homozygous recessive? So taking a look at using those numbers, if we have a frequency of, point zero, of 0 0.6 for the dominant, if we square that value, that will give you the frequency of homozygous dominant individuals in the population. If we take the p value and the q value, 2pq multiply by those each other by each other excuse me and then multiply that by 2 that will give you the frequency of heterozygous individuals in the population and then if we take the little a value of 0 0.4 square that value that will give you the frequency of homozygous recessive individuals in the environment so now that we have that information, how many of those individuals will have the dominant phenotype? Phenotype, what you look like. And remember that there are two genotypes that will give you a dominant phenotype. So we take the P squared value and we add it to the 2PQ value. And that will tell us that 84% of the population will show the dominant phenotype. So this is just a way to have you work through that Hardy-Weinberg formula and um, just get comfortable with those with those formulas. All right, some mis mis misconceptions that we have to deal with. Alleles are not, not the same thing as traits. Alleles are the forms, okay, um, of a particular trait. The dominant phenotype is not the same as the dominant allele. Dominant inheritance of dominant alleles can give you a dominant expression, but those two words are not um, interchangeable. Also, Students think that the two Hardy-Weinberg equations are actually telling us about the same thing. They're actually not. And frequency can only be represented by percentages. That's not true. If you remember the example I just gave you, the frequencies were represented by decimals. They can be represented by fractions. And so frequencies can be represented in any of those mathematical ways that are equivalent to each other. So let's take a look at a practice here, and I'm not going to read through the entire, entire question, but some things to point out here is that we're looking at a recessive genetic disorder. We are looking at a general population and the frequency of that disorder in the population, which is one out of 150,000. We are looking at an isolated population, and the frequency in the isolated population is one in 500. And what we're looking at is, is there a change in the calculated differences, or is there a calculated difference, excuse me, of the frequency of this genetic disorder in this population? So applying our formulas here, I have this here. So first of all, we have to recognize that these representations, one in 150,000, is referring to the individual. It's not referring to the genetic allele. It's saying that the, these are how many people have the disorder and each person carries two alleles for that trait. And so if we use these formulas, we can find P squared, we can take the square root of that and we can find the frequency of just P, the dominant. Um, if we take a look at the isolated population, we can take a look at um, uh, 
that one there and we can find the calculation there as well. And so ultimately we find out that if we do those calculations correctly, then, oh, sorry, go back here. If we do those calculations correctly, then we should find out that the allele is a 0 0.0447 versus a 0 0.0026, which means that the two of them are not in equilibrium because they're not the same values. And I do believe here in this formula, oh my goodness, there's so many things going on today. Um, that that should be a Q squared instead of a P squared. And we're dealing with a, with a recessive genetic disorder. And so uh, the formulas work out the same, but we are solving for Q instead of P squared. So my apologies there. So that would be a solving for a Q uh, and solving for a Q in both of those populations, but the calculated values work out. All right, so what should we take away? We should take away here that evolution is characterized by changes in genetic makeups of populations over time, and that it is important to understand that we can use these formulas to give us an idea of whether or not populations are changing um, based on the frequencies of those occurrences. And so there we have our overviews of our exams. Don't forget those important dates. Uh, make sure that you are all ready to go for those exams. And tomorrow, we're going to have the wonderful Chris Monsoor. Mr. Monsoor is going to bring you into part two of natural selection, and he's going to take you through the rest of that topic. So thank you all for joining me. I apologize. Everything, you know, some things just got a little bit mixed up there, but I think that we worked through it and hopefully you learned something. And I just want to give a couple shout outs to Mrs. Kelly from Costa Mesa High, uh, Patel from McMinn County High, Mr. Rogan's class, AP Bio class in New York, New York, go Spartans, Mrs. Brown's class and Mrs. Nova Rouse fifth period class period five. I made it through. Uh, let me know what you think. It's okay uh, to make mistakes sometimes as long as we can come back and fix them. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for hanging in there with AP Bio Live today. And this is Mrs. Evans, Biology Out. <laughs>